the Lord's Supper. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died but if we judged ourselves truly we would not be judged but when we are judged by the lord we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful to be able to meet together, to listen to your word, to learn from it. Lord, as we learn about your supper, may it bring questions to mind, Lord. May it give us thought. May it provoke us, Lord, to actually take a bit of consideration as to what we do and how we do it and why we do it. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this. We pray, Lord, that we will listen to you this morning, to what you have to speak to our hearts. Pray for John now, Lord, as he brings your words. Open our minds. Open our ears, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Carlin, for that this morning. Thank you. Uh, This morning we are in the third week of our series, our short series, Life in the Ordinary. And last week, we've done two weeks, last week was really looking at the word read and preached and the importance of that in a gathering uh, as we come together as a church. And really what this series is about is why we do the things that we do on a Sunday morning. Why do we why do we hear the word read? Why do we hear the word preached? Why do we uh, celebrate baptisms when we can? Why do we have communion when we, when, we can, uh, when we do, as we're looking at this morning? And as I said, that is the focus of today, communion, the Lord's Supper. If you remember the passage from a couple of weeks ago, Acts 2, we see there that the church, these new believers, these 3,000-some new believers, 
were devoted to, it tells us they were devoted to certain things. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. So we, we, we learn that they were devoted to communion as we know it. They were devoted to this. This was a part of what they did on a regular basis. And so this morning, what we're looking at here in communion is a, a, an element of Christian, the Christian church, church history, that has been much debated. There's been much debate about communion in, in several different uh, aspects. And so what I, and much of the debate around communion is around the elements themselves. The elements. Now, I'm going to take the elements here for, for a visual representation of what they are. Uh, they are the bread and, as we use, the juice or, or wine. Now, much of the debate goes around the fact of what these are. From a Roman Catholic tradition, uh, what they believe that these are is really important. What they believe these to be are the actual body and the actual blood of Christ Jesus. Now, from a Roman Catholic tradition, from a Roman Catholic background, they believe that these become the body and become the blood at the moment of consecration. That is, when a priest consecrates the elements, then they become the actual body and the actual blood. That's what they believe. The doctrine of this is called transubstantiation. That's what the actual doctrine's name is. However, the Reformed church tradition in which we stand don't believe that. And this is a, it's a, it's a vital distinction to make. It may seem elementary or, or foolish, but, it, but it's not. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vital distinction, distinction that we have to make. What we believe in the Reformed tradition is that these are simply what they are. They are just bread. And they are, this is just juice. We don't believe that they become something else. We don't believe that there is any actual power in the elements themselves. We believe them to be simply symbolic. They show us. They, they help us remember. Now, I, I will say this as I, as I put these back. I will say this. Just because we believe them to be symbolic and have actual no power in and of themselves, that doesn't mean that there's any or spiritual significance in them or in the act that we do every Sunday. In fact, quite the opposite is true. And I'll go on to explain why that is as we go through this text this morning. But we simply believe them to be symbolic elements of Christ's body and His blood. There are also debates around how often you should participate in this. Should it be every time the church come together? Should it be sporadically? Should it be set up? You know, you know maybe some denominations do it quarterly. There, there are many debates around that. To be honest, those debates aren't really that important. They're not. We fall into a category where we celebrate the Lord's Supper every time we come together on the Lord's Day as the gathered church. That's our choice. That's the way we choose to do it. Other churches choose to do it differently. That's up to them. We choose to do it this way because we believe that it says every time you meet, you should do it. That's just what we believe. But there are many different debates, many different thoughts. But what actually matters when it comes to this? That's the most important thing, and that's what we're going to look at today. What actually matters? Why do we actually do this? The context of what Paul is writing into here is massively important. The Apostle Paul is writing to a church in Corinth, a church that, that he helped to plant, and a church that was planted in a city that was, if you want to term it any other way, you, 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 you maybe term it like this, it was a cesspit of sin. This, this city, Corinth, was known as, in the then known world, as a cesspit of sin. Like, this place was as licentious as it gets. It was a, a well-known trade route, uh, and people would come and stay for a while. They would move on. They would do whatever they needed to do there. They wouldn't spend much time there. Quite transient. 
And so this place just become an absolute cesspit of sin. But here's the reality. I was struck by this reality in the first service as well. No matter whether Paul be in Corinth, whether we be in Rathfriland, and this is really important as we come to this today, we can look at the context here and think, oh, cesspit, absolute sinful place to be. The reality is that every single place on the earth is filled with sin. We might just look better. Like we come in here this morning, and most of us are uh, most of us have had a shower. I'll, I'll take I'll, I'll I'll take that as a given. Most of us, maybe. Uh, William's nodding. William had a shower, folks. Brilliant. That's that's a good thing. The pig farmer that he is, that's great. All right. So you don't you don't realize you don't realize the significance of William having a shower. All right. We should we should actually get William not to have a shower. All right. And then come in some Sunday morning. Then you'd know. Right. So, most of us come in, we look clean, we look respectable, blah, blah, blah. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. While we're in Corinth, while we're in Rothschild, it doesn't make any difference. We're all sinners. Everyone in the world is a sinful place. But Paul writes into this church, and he explicitly writes to them on the point of church discipline. Now, there's a concept that's not overly, you know, valued in today's church, church discipline. He wants to correct this fledgling church in the ways that they are going wrong and in the ways that they are sinning. And so he writes to them. He writes to them about church discipline. First Corinthians 5, you can read there about a situation where someone is having a relationship with their stepmother that they shouldn't be having. And what Paul says into that situation is, put them out of the church. Put them out. Treat them like unbelievers. And so Paul takes sin extremely seriously, not to be trifled with, not to be messed with. He writes to them about this situation of communion in the context of sin. Look at, look at the opening lines of this passage today. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you and he's going to correct them on sinfulness when it comes to communion. And so he's taking the issue of sin seriously. And what the issue seems to have been here when they come together for communion is that those who were more well off seemed to be trampling on those who were less well off. They were marginalizing the marginalized. And Paul says, that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. He talks about people going ahead and eating and, 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 and filling themselves while others go hungry. He talks about people going ahead and drinking all the wine and getting drunk and leaving none for the others. And there's a couple of things I want to point out just about that in itself. One is this. This seems to have been an act that happened almost on a daily basis. Communion was part of their life together. That when the church gathered, they had communion. They, they remembered Jesus in this way. That, that's, you know, some, uh, some church, church traditions say that they should maybe have communion once a quarter, and that's fine, and that's up to them. Because, and the reason for that is because it will lose its meaning. These folks did it almost on a daily basis, and it never lost its meaning. The second thing to note about the context here is Paul's overwhelming concern for the poor and the marginalized. The rich in the church were feasting while the poor received nothing. And again, Paul's concern, the issue that Paul has, should be a picture of the equality that exists in the church. It should be a beautiful picture that we all come in here today and we are equal. Equal. Like we are all sinners. We all come before the Lord the same way. There should be no one treated any differently than anyone else. 
This should be a place where we all feel that equality and all feel that equalness in the family of God. Folks, nowhere else in the world should this be the case, or would we expect it to be the case? Like, no matter where you go and no matter what sphere of life you move in, whether it's, I used the football club as an example this morning, whether it's the bowling club, whether it's the, wherever it may be, any other sphere of life that you move in, you, will, you wouldn't expect there to be an equality like there is in the church. Clichés are clichés for a reason because they're, they're, they're usually true. And the cliché that we're all equal at the foot of the cross is 100% accurate. We're all equal. None better than any other. And Paul's concern here was that there was some being treated as, as if they didn't deserve this, as if they were less. And that's just not true. Some of you will have come in here this morning feeling like you don't deserve to be here. Like you're not worthy of being here, that you're not worthy of, of singing praise, that you're not worthy of prayer, that you're not worthy of communion, that you're not worthy of all these things. I just want to say to you now, right now, hear me, that's nonsense. And it is a lie from Satan himself. Don't believe it. Do not believe it. We are all equals. We all come with the same nonsense. We all come with the same sin to the foot of the cross. We should be equal as a family. That was Paul's concern, and it should be our concern as well. Right. So, communion in and of itself. Why do we do it? Why every Sunday do we? Do? Is it is it just for the emotions? Do you know, we get the old emotions go. Is it just because it's what we do? You know, when we sing, we come forward and we can see the elements. And we, we, is, it, is it just for that? No. There is spiritual significance in what we do. And I really want us to get this this morning. So, to, to, to force the, the point home, I'm not doing three points, not doing four points, not even five points. Seven this morning. All right? Seven. Do you hear the fear that's in the room? Cast that out in Jesus' name. <laughs> I, I laughed at the first one. I was like, seriously, I'm going to give you a number here, and you're going to freak out. Like, usually it's three. Today, seven. They're really, really quick, all right? I promise. They're really, really quick. TJ, you'll not have to do that again. Promise. All right? Seven, right? What do we do, and why do we do it? Why do we do this? Well, one. Jesus has told us, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 24 and 25. So we engage our minds. Really important. We engage our minds. God has given us minds to think. All right? Now, fair point, some of us use them more than others. Let's just and some of you are using them more than others right now, because some of you got that, and some of you didn't. And the ones that didn't aren't thinking. I know. I can tell. I, I fire wee things in now again. I just get, eh. What? No. He's asking us to use our minds. Remember, cognitively, think. Think. So we are to consciously call to mind the person of Jesus and what he has done and what he accomplished on the cross. The fact that he died, the fact that he rose again, the fact that he took our punishment, the fact that it means forgiveness of sins, and the fact that we are asked to remember is a stark reminder time after time that Christianity is not some sort of New Age spirituality. Because what are we remembering? We are remembering fact, historical fact. Like we can, we can literally point back in history, trace back in history to Jesus going to our cross. It's fact. And so we are to remember with our minds that Jesus went to a Roman cross, died in the place of sinners, so that anyone who believes in him might be rescued from the wrath of God. And that, in turn, is to lead us to worship and adoration. 
That's number one. We are to remember using our minds. But not only are we to remember using our minds, and not only is it a very cognitive thing, it is also a spiritual thing. Number two, we celebrate our union with Christ Jesus. We celebrate our union with Christ. In communion, we are, remi- we are reminded that we are united with Him. We are united with Him in His sufferings, we are uni- and we will be united with Him in His resurrection. And you see, this is, a, this is a spiritual act by faith. You see, everything I've described so far in the process of communion, what we do, unbelievers can do. Unbelievers can eat. Unbelievers can drink. Unbelievers can remember. But unbelievers cannot, cannot, by faith, be united with Christ. They can't. Only believers can do that. And so this is a spiritual act by faith in which we grow in grace. Communion is a gift to us. And that's what it means as a means of grace to us. It's to encourage us to our, in our faith spiritually. Number three, again a reminder, we share this meal as an equal family. We share this meal as an equal family. As I say, Paul's argument here in chapter 11 largely revolves around people going ahead, some getting too much to eat, some others not having anything. I want to ask you this morning, do you, you, personally, see us as equals? Do you see us as equals? My gut feeling is that probably not many of us will go towards the side of feeling above people. Not many of us will go there. But the majority of us possibly could go to feel less than others. You're not. You're not. You are a valued image bearer of God. If you are in Christ, you are an equal part of this family. I don't care what age you are. Don't care what background you have. You are an equal fa- part of this family. And we remember that as we take communion together. One of the most beautiful things about communion, yeah, I find, is when I see the younger ones coming up for communion. It, it, for me, and I, I don't know, I'm an emotional like, I've been an emotional wreck for the last week. I'm not joking you. Like, all that's going on. Can't handle it. But one of the most beautiful things is for me is when the younger ones come forward for communion. Because it reminds me that we are equal. We are equal in Christ. I am no more valued than an 11 year old who comes forward for communion. We're equals. And it reminds us of that. Four, we focus on the singularity of the one we worship. Verse 20, is it not the Lord's Supper that we eat? There's one God, Christ Jesus. We're we're saying that when we come for communion, there's one God. We're not polytheists. We don't believe in many gods. We believe in one. Now, in our lives, do we actually live like that though? Or or, or are we placing gods on, small g gods on God's throne and worshipping them rather than Him? Are there there things, genuinely, are there things right now in your life that are taking the place of the one true God? I don't know if you think about it, I don't know if you're conscious of it, but maybe today as we focus on communion and what this is supposed to be, maybe now is the time to think about it. What is taking his place? Because this is clearly an act of worshiping the one true God. One true God. Number five. That's four. Let me recap very, very quickly. We remember with our minds. It is a spiritual act where we celebrate our union with Christ. We share this meal as an equal family and we focus on the singularity of the one we worship. Number five. And this is one maybe that you, you don't, we don't tend to think about. Number five, it leads us to a place 
communion and the act of communion and the way we set it up every week leads us to a place of purification. It leads us to a place of purification. Look at the text. Verse 28. Let a person examine himself and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For if anyone eats and, and drinks without discerning the body, they eat and drink judgment on themselves. Right. So what does that mean? Every single week we have this opportunity to come before God, to confess our sins, to repent of our sins and turn from them in faith to Christ Jesus. We have this opportunity of self-examination, asking. Now, here's the thing when it comes to self-examination. We don't see half the stuff. You don't see half the stuff. I don't see half the stuff that I'm, that I'm sinning in. That's the reality. And so when we come to the part of communion where we're saying examine ourselves, we need to pray in that moment that the Holy Spirit would show us in that moment what we need to repent of. Show us. Show us where we've went wrong. Show us. Show us where we've sinned. Show us where we've said things wrong, thought things wrong, did things wrong. Show us. Because we don't see it. I say this, and I'm speaking to myself, there is no one more blind to your sin than you. There is no one more blind to your sin than you. And there is no one more blind to my sin than me. And so we need the Spirit of God to show us. When we examine ourselves, pray that He would show you. Well, what does repentance look like? Because what we say every Sunday is this. Take this time. Confess your sin before God. Repent. Turn to Jesus in faith. What does repentance look like? What does actual real repentance look like? Well, it means this. It means a turning from sin. Actively turning from sin and employing, asking the Spirit to help us to stop. Now, there are there are people in here who have patterns of sin in their lives that they've been struggling with for years, and they've been asking God to help them for years. And I don't want you to hear in this that, that, that you're not doing the right thing. You are. If you've been praying for forgiveness, asking for help, you're doing the right thing. But to, but to come in here on a Sunday to ask for forgiveness, to repent, and go out and actively do the same thing is actually throwing the grace of God in his face. We are to actively wage war against sin. And that means asking the Spirit to help us. And we will fall and we will fail. Hear me. We will fall and we will fail. And in those moments, there's grace. But we're to actively seek the power of the Holy Spirit for help in our fight against sin. I love this passage because there's one wee bit of it that is, for me, it's just fantastic. Let me, let me read it to you. Let a person examine himself. And do you, see the, do you see the time lag between that part and the next part? There isn't one. Let me read it. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So what we're saying in here today is not that you have to, you know, beat yourself up over sin or not that you have to go away from here and you have to uh, lead, a, lead a good life for a week and then come back again and then take the elements or, or do this or do this or, or, or keep certain laws or whatever it is. We're not saying that. We're saying come, confess, repent, and then run, run to the table because that's what the table's about. There's no time lag. There's no time for navel-gazing. There's no time for feeling sorry for ourselves. There's no time. It is confess, repent, turn to Jesus, run to the table. Run to the table. 
It leads us to a place of purification. Number six, it leads us to a place of proclamation. Proclamation. What I mean by that? Well, we proclaim in two ways. When we take communion, when you take communion, when you come to the front, when you take the elements, you are proclaiming a message. You're giving out a message in two ways. One, you're proclaiming to unbelievers the message of the gospel. What you're doing when when we come and we take the elements of of, of bread and juice, what we're saying to any unbelievers who may be in the room is this. Christ saves, and He's the only way to save. And here's our, our proclamation to you come and be saved. That's what we're saying. It is a proclamation, not only to unbelievers, but also to believers. This is the second thing we're doing when we come and take communion. We are proclaiming the gospel to each other. And how are we doing that? Well, when I go and take the elements, and if you know me at all and know how sinful I am, then you're saying, if there's hope for him, there's hope for me too. And so when you come and take the elements, you're saying to someone else in the room, if there's hope for me, there's hope for you too. If there's good news for me, there's good news for you. And it is a proclamation of the gospel until he comes that there is hope in Christ, hope in Christ alone. And so it encourages the body. So we proclaim in two ways. One, to unbelievers, this is the message of salvation. Christ died for you. Two, we proclaim to each other, there is hope in the gospel. Finally, number seven. See, those were really quick, weren't they? Really quick. Bothered through them seven, rightly. Good work. Right. Number seven. It is this. Not only... In communion, are we remembering Christ Jesus and all that he has done for us? But we are looking forward in anticipation to the day that each one of us, if we are in Christ, will sit around the feasting table of Jesus. You see, there will be a day when all of us who are in Christ will sit with him in glory and feast together. Now, I want you to get a good picture of that. What a day. What a day when the reality of our equalness in Christ will be revealed clearer than we've ever saw it before. There will be no bad seats at that table, by the way. I know some of you this week have been to Gareth Brooks to which I wasn't invited. Just want to make that clear. I wasn't asked, all right? I've said the first time, I'm not bitter about it. Not bitter at all for long. I will get over it. There's no bigger fan of Garth Brooks than me, I'm just saying. Uh, If you start a song, I'll finish it. I can guarantee you that. But inevitably, there was bad seats in Croke Park. It's a stadium. It's going to be better seats than others. The girl that cut my hair the other day, and didn't she do a fine job? Uh, the girl that cut my hair the other day was literally about three foot one, right? And she had standing tickets. She said she saw his head for about 30 seconds. <laughs> that was it. Inevitably, there was, there, was, there was bad seats. Folks, there are no bad seats. No bad seats at the table of Christ. We will all be there. We will all see His glory. We will be able to see the nails, the prints of the nails in His hands. We will be able to see where He took the spear in His side. We will be able to see the nail prints in His feet for what He did for us. What a day. And this meal is a reminder and a a looking forward to that day. What a day. What a day that will be. This, folks, is a full gospel picture. 
just like we're going to talk about baptism next week, is a full gospel picture. This is a full gospel picture. Jesus Christ took our punishment, went to the cross, died, spilled his blood, his body was broken. He rose again. He is ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father. And one day when he returns, we will all be seated with him at that table. This is a full gospel picture. And this is why we do what we do. Right, what about now then? What about now? Here's the reality. Nobody in this room, nobody in this room has brought a successful spiritual week in through the door. Is there anybody? No. Didn't think so. I didn't either. What, and I sort of questioned myself in the first service as well, what would a successful spiritual week look like? Would it be that we ticked all our boxes? Would it be that we did all our readings and said all our prayers? Nope. Because that's what would be called being a Pharisee. But the reality is that none of us, not one of us, have brought a, a successful spiritual week in here. We have sinned in numerous, countless ways. And what we're going to do now is just take a moment and we're going to pray and we are going to confess our sins to God. We're going to ask for that Holy Spirit to come, for the, the, the person of the Spirit to come and con, con, just convict us and, and show us our sin. We're going to confess and we're going to repent and we're going to turn to faith in Christ. That's what we're going to do. Psalm 19, cleanse me of hidden faults. Hold back your servant from presumptuous sins. So in silence, just for a couple of minutes, we are going to examine ourselves. And then I'll pray. And then Ian and the guys are going to lead us in worship. And then, if you're a follower of Christ, run to the table. That's what it's for. It is for us as sinners who have confessed their sin, repented of their sin, and we hold on to the promise of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Let's just take a moment. Father, we thank you for your absolutely amazing grace to us. Grace that we honestly cannot fathom. Poured out. 
poured out on sinners like us. Thank you for it. We rest in it and ask for a fresh applying of your grace to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.